Hi friends, welcome back to our series of sessions on energy conservation and management. So we, are, we have been dealing with boiler energy conservation in that let's see today about water treatment of boiler feed water. Producing quality steam on demand depends on properly managed water treatment to control steam purity, deposits and corrosion. A boiler is the sump of the boiler system. It ultimately receives all the pre-boiler contaminants. Boiler performance, efficiency, and service life are direct products of selecting and controlling boiler feed water used in the boiler. When feed water enters the boiler, the elevated temperatures and pressures cause the components of water to behave differently. Most of the components in the feed water are soluble. However, under heat and pressure, most of the soluble components come out of this solution as particulate solids, sometimes in crystallized forms and other times as amorphous particles. When solubility of a specific component in water is exceeded, scale or deposits develop. The boiler water must be sufficiently free of deposit forming solids to allow rapid and efficient heat transfer and it must not be corrosive to the boiler metal. Deposits in control boilers may result from hardness contamination of feed water and corrosion products from the condensate and feed water system. Hardness contamination of the feed water may arise due to deficient softener system. Deposits and corrosion result in efficiency losses and may result in boiler tube failures and inability to produce steam. Deposits act as insulators and slow heat transfer. Large amounts of deposits throughout the boiler could reduce the heat transfer enough to reduce the boiler efficiency significantly. Different types of deposits affect the boiler efficiency differently. Thus, it may be useful to analyze the deposits for its characteristics. The insulating effect of deposits causes the boiler metal temperature to rise and may lead to tube failure by overheating. Then the impurities causing deposits. The most important chemicals contained in water that influences the formation of deposits in the boilers are the salts of calcium and magnesium, which are known as hardness salts. Calcium and magnesium bicarbonate dissolve in water to form an alkaline solution, and these salts are known as alkaline hardness. They decompose upon heating, releasing carbon dioxide and forming a soft sludge which settles down. These are called temporary hardness, hardness that can be removed by boiling. Calcium and magnesium sulfates, chlorides and nitrates, etc., when dissolved in water are chemically neutral and are known as non-alkaline hardness. These are called permanent hardness and form hard scales on boiler surfaces, which are difficult to remove. Non-alkalinity hardness chemicals fall out of the solution due to reduction in solubility as the temperature rises by concentration due to evaporation which takes place within the boiler or by chemical change to a less soluble compound. The presence of silica in boiler water can rise to formation of hard silicate scales. It can also associate with calcium and magnesium salts forming calcium and magnesium silicates of very low thermal conductivity. Silica can give rise to deposits on steam turbine blades after being carried out over either in droplets of water in steam or in volatile form in steam at high pressures. Two major types of boiler water treatment are internal water treatment and external water treatment. Internal treatment is carried out by adding chemicals to boiler to prevent the formation of scale by converting the scale forming compounds to free flowing sludges which can be removed by blowdown. This method is limited to boilers where feed water is low in hardness salts to low pressures. High TDS content in boiler water is tolerated and when only small quantity of water is required to be treated. If these conditions are not applied, then high rates of blowdown are required to dispose of the sludge. They become uneconomical from heat and water loss consideration. Different waters require different chemicals. Sodium carbonate, sodium aluminate, sodium phosphate, sodium sulfite and compounds of vegetable or inorganic origin are all used for this purpose. Proprietary chemicals are also available 
to suit various water conditions. The specialist must be consulted to determine the most suitable chemicals to use in each case. Internal treatment alone is not recommended. External treatment is used to remove suspended solids, dissolved solids, particularly the calcium and magnesium ions, which are a major cause of scale formation and dissolved gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide. The external treatment process available are ion exchange, demineralization, reverse osmosis, and deaeration. Before any of these are used, it is necessary to remove suspended solids and color from the raw water because these may foul the resins used in the subsequent treatment sections. Methods of pretreatment include simple sedimentation in settling tanks or settling in clarifiers with the aid of coagulants and flocculants. Pressure and sand filters with spray aeration to remove carbon dioxide and iron may be used to remove metal salts from borewell water. The first stage of treatment is to remove hardness salt and possibly non-hardness salts. Removal of only hardness salts is called softening, while total removal of salts from solution is called demineralization. The processes are ion exchange process, which is basically a softener plant. In ion exchange process, the hardness is removed as water passes through the bed of natural zeolite or synthetic resin and without the formation of any precipitate. The simplest type of base exchange in which calcium and magnesium ions are exchanged for sodium ions. After saturation, regeneration is done with sodium chloride. The sodium salts being soluble do not form scales in boilers. Since base exchanger only replaces calcium and magnesium with sodium, it does not reduce the TDS content and blowdown quantity. It also does not reduce the alkalinity. Dem demineralization is the complete elimination or removal of all salts. This is achieved by using a cation resin, which exchanges the cations in the raw water with hydrogen ions, producing hydrochloric, sulfuric, and carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is removed in designing cover in which air is blown through the acid water. Following this, the water passes through an anion resin, which exchanges anions with the mineral acid, that is sulfuric acid, and forms water. Regeneration of cations and anions is necessary at intervals using typically mineral acid and caustic soda respectively. The complete removal of silica can be achieved by correct choice of anion resin. Ion exchange processes can be used for almost total demineralization if required, as is the case in large electric power plants. In deaeration, most of the dissolved gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide are expelled by preheating the feed water before it enters the boil. All natural waters contain dissolved gases in solution. Certain gases such as carbon dioxide and oxygen greatly increase corrosion. When heated in boiler systems, carbon dioxide and oxygen are released as gases and combined with water to form carbonic acid. Removal of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other non-condensable gases from boiler feed water is vital to boiler equipment longevity as well as safety of operation. Carbonic acid corrodes metal, reducing the life of equipment and piping. It also dissolves iron, which in when returned to the boiler precipitates and causes scaling on the boiler tubes. This scale not only contributes to reducing the life of the equipment, but also increases the amount of energy needed to achieve heat transfer. Deaeration can be done by mechanical deaeration, by chemical dehydration, or by both together. Mechanical deaeration for the removal of dissolved gases is typically utilized prior to the addition of chemical oxygen scavengers. Mechanical deaeration is based on Charles and Henry's law of physics. Simplified, this law states that removal of oxygen and carbonic acid can be accomplished by heating the boiler feed water, which reduces the concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere surrounding the feed water. Mechanical deaeration can be the most economical. They operate at the boiling point of water with the pressure in the deaerator. They can be of vacuum or pressure type. The vacuum type of deaerator operates atmospheric pressure at about 82 degrees centigrade 
can reduce the oxygen content in water to less than 0.02 milligram per liter. Vacuum pumps or steam ejectors are required to maintain the vacuum. Whereas the pressure type deaerators operate by allowing steam into the feed water through a pressure control valve to maintain the desired operating pressure and hence temperature at a minimum of 105 degrees centigrade. The steam rises the water temperature causing release of oxygen and carbon dioxide gases that are then vented from the system. This type can reduce the oxygen content to 0.005 milligram per liter. Where excess low pressure steam is available, the operating pressure can be selected to make use of the steam and hence improve fuel economy. In boiler systems, steam is preferred for deaeration because steam is essentially free from oxygen and carbon dioxide. Steam is readily available and steam adds the heat required to complete the deaeration. While most efficient mechanical deaerators reduces oxygen to very low levels, that is 0.005 milligram per liter, even trace amounts of oxygen may cause corrosion damage to a system. Consequently, good operating practice requires removal of that oxygen with a chemical oxygen scavenger, such as sodium sulfide or hydrazine. Sodium sulfite reacts with oxygen to form sodium sulfate, which increases the TDS in the boiler water and hence increases the blowdown requirements and makeup water quality. Hydrazine reacts with oxygen to form nitrogen and water. It is invariably used in high pressure boilers when low water boiler water solids are necessary as it does not increase the TDS of the boiler water. Reverse osmosis uses the fact that when solutions of different concentrations are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, water from less concentrated solution passes through the membrane to dilute the liquid of high concentration. If the solution of high concentration is pressurized, the process is reversed and the water from the solution of high concentration flows to the weaker solution. This is known as reverse osmosis. The quality of water produced depends upon the concentration of the solution on the high pressure side and pressure differential across the membrane. The process is suitable for waters with very high TDS, such as seawater. This semi-permeable nature of the membrane allows the water to pass much more readily than the dissolved minerals. Since water in the less concentrated solution seeks to dilute the more concentrated solution, the water passage through the membrane generates a noticeable head difference between the two solutions. The head difference is the measure of the concentration difference of the two solutions and is referred to as the osmotic difference. When a pressure is applied to the concentrated solution, which is great that the atmospheric pressure difference, the direction of water passage through the membrane is reversed and the process that we refer to reverse osmosis is established. That is the membrane's ability to selectively pass water is unchanged, only the direction of water flow is changed. The feed water and concentrate, which is nothing but reject stream, ports illustrate a continuously operating reverse osmosis system. Then the recommended boiler and feed water quality, the impurities found in boiler water depend on the untreated feed water quality, the treatment process used, and the boiler operating pressures procedures. As a general rule, the higher the boiler operating pressure, the greater will be the sensitivity to impurities. The recommended water levels are discussed here. The total iron maximum PPM, when the boiler pressure is up to 20 kg force per square centimeter, when it is 21 to 39 kg per square centimeter, when the boiler pressure is 41 to 59 kg force per square centimeters. So for different levels, we are saying the total iron maximum PPM is recommended up to 0 0.05, 0 0.02 and 0 0.01. As we go higher the pressures, the lesser will be the requirement of these contaminants. Then total copper 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01 same. And then total silica, one is the recommended for higher pressures to 0.3 and 0.1. Oxygen PPM is 0 0.02, 0 0.02, and 0 0.01 for higher pressures. Hydrazine, the residual PPM is 0.02 to 0.004. It is used only in high pressure boilers. And the pH at 25 degrees centigrade is 
recommended level is 8.8 .8 to 9.2 for both up to 39 kg force per square centimeter. Then for high pressure boilers from 41 to 59 is the recommended level is 8.2 to 9.2. Then the hardness in PPM is 1 and 0.5 and hardness is not at all recommended when at high pressure boilers. So this is what about the boiler uh, feed water control, feed water treatment. Hope you have enjoyed the session.